Hello, good evening everybody and a very warm welcome to this uh, Farm Advisory Service webinar. It's a particularly warm, uh, glorious evening outside, so uh, we're grateful to have everybody on here tonight. Um, tonight is the first part of our uh, Farm Advisory Service Sustainable Beef System series. So sustainability obviously is uh, all over everything we do at the moment. And uh, we've got some really good stories to tell. We've got some things as an industry we need to work on. And we've picked out, uh, we'll explain more later on of what the, the agenda for all these, um, the different parts of the sustainability series are. But um, yeah, there's, there's plenty to look forward to. Tonight's one perhaps seems a wee bit out of place and that we're talking about outwintering not long before the, the longest day. So we're in, in the middle of the summer, um, glorious weather, silage making's happening and we're now talking about outwintering. But the key part there is there's a lot of these crops going in the ground and the options for outwintering really, you know, the the, the main crop options uh, to establish really need to be done in the next few weeks. So I should say I'm Robert Ramsey. So I work as an, an agricultural consultant out of Air Office. Uh, for SEC Consulting. Uh, I am a beef and sheep farmer at home and I've got quite an interest in low-cost beef systems and also in outwintering. I uh, grow a bit of kale and things and I've probably, uh, Paddy and Andy both know this, made a bit of a mess of it back and forward and made the mistakes that other people have made too. Uh, and I think there's a lot of learning in there too. So uh, yeah, that's that's why I'm, I'm involved or interested here. But we've got two very esteemed um, speakers for us this evening. It'll be quite a laid back webinar. Uh, so we don't have lots of slides. We don't have death by PowerPoint at all. Uh, but we have Paddy Jack from DLF Seeds, um, who probably needs no introduction, um, but certainly knows the the forage crop um, market and a process inside out. And we also have Andy Nelson. So Andy has two hats on tonight. The, the hat that we asked him to wear is the is the farmer hat. So uh, Andy's worked with um, a lot of outwintering options uh, on his farm in the southwest, but also works for Watson Seed. So there is hopefully not going to be too much. Um, too much competition on the webinar tonight, but uh, it certainly be wrong not to highlight the fact that Andy has has his other hat on too. So without any further ado from me, uh, if I could just ask Paddy to take over to talk about all things forage crop, really. Yeah, um, absolutely delighted to do so, Robert. Um, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome. Uh, I'm Paddy Jack. I work with DLF Seeds, who are based uh, just to the west of Edinburgh at Broxburn. Um, Robert said it seems rather strange to be talking about these things just prior to the uh, shortest day of the year. But of course, planning is so important in, in, in winter preparation for forage crops. And indeed, uh, for main crops, crops that are going to go right through to February and March, which are the Swedes and the Kales, um, then we really need to think about getting them into the ground pretty soon if the Swedes, for instance, aren't sown yet. What I plan to do is briefly go through and, and do it rather, rather quickly through the brassica crops and then some of the other crops that aren't brassicas like fodder beet and, and maybe even forage rye. But simply, um, we have main crops, first of all, the things like Swedes, which you've been growing for many years. They love moisture. They yield really, really well. They're pretty easy to grow now. Um, there is a herbicide, uh, two herbicides that we use quite successfully. And they you know, can give a pretty predictable yield in relatively wet summers. Um, we used to always say that Swedes should be drilled in May, and if you failed, if the flea beetle took them out and you went into June, you probably looked at sowing main crop turnips. L lately, I've seen a switch where people are now sowing Swedes as late as July um, and getting really, really good uh, crops um, after a silage crop, for instance. So I think we need to look at moisture, and if moisture's coming, we sow Swedes. I, I think they're still going to give you the best cover for February and March. They'll probably give you something in the region of eight, nine, ten tons of dry matter a hectare. 
Um, you know, people say they're all full of water, but the water is very good. But they, they are worth looking at. They're also worth putting into mixtures, particularly along with kale um, at a very small inclusion because they, they bulk up underneath the kale. And if you get a rise where maybe the kale hasn't done so well, you'll find that the Swedes often do a bit better. So Swedes um, are one of the uh, best for lasting into February, March because they're frost tolerant. Um, the, the, the harder they are, the higher the dry matter. So something like an invitation um, would be what I would put furthest away from the gateway or furthest away from where you're sowing. So it's the last to get to. So something soft, um, you know, at the start and then a Kenmore and then a Ruta or whatever, a Lomond, and then, you know, an invitation at the furthest away. And that's the sort of way I would utilize them. Precision sowing is still very important, but a lot of people do now just drill them with a grain drill, um, uh, a kilo an acre, kilo and a quarter an acre, drilled with a grain drill, no need to wait for the, the, um, the precision sower to come in. The other crop that will take us through to uh, February in most seasons, and I do say most seasons because um, if you have a lot of snow and the pigeons find it or it gets brackled over or something goes wrong with frost, it does disappear. The other one would be a leafy brassica, which is kale. Um, Robert's had various successes with it, but kale generally will go through to, um, to February. Um, uh, so, you know, it's good to have brassica crops that will give us a winter period as well. Um, flea beetle attacks swedes, so we need to spray swedes very often. Kale is like a magnet for, for flea beetle. Um, so you need everything right with kale. It is the, it's the blue face lester of the brassica crops. It will die if it can. So um, it needs excellent fertility. It needs pH beyond many counties of Scotland. Um, it really does need a 6-2 uh, pH. It needs phosphate and potash and nitrogen. Nitrogen has to be 125 kilograms. It really needs to be well looked after. So a good farm for growing kale. Um, and probably you need to go out when it's at the cotyledon stage or the two true leaf stage and look for flea beetle. Um, chemical is available to spray flea beetle. It just doesn't work like the old chemicals used to work. So um, even if you get sort of five or six days protection with it, you probably may need to, to spray again. So if you've got a lot of hedges and, 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 and high trees around, or even worse, neighbors growing a lot of oilseed rape um, or other brassicas, you might find that the flea beetle pressure is too great for kale. But kale, high yielding, nine, 10 tons of dry matter a hectare, you know, um, for outwintering cows, you should be able to keep five cows on a hectare for about three and three and a bit months, hundred days, something like that. Um, something similar for Swedes. So these are good, high yielding crops um, uh, with, with plenty of success in Scotland. For cows, it doesn't matter whether you feed a marrow stemmed one or, or, or a hybrid, you know, a branching one, any sort of kale will do as long as it's high yielding. Um, club root tolerance, um, some of them have better club root tolerance than others. Uh, to be honest, that's marginally better than other varieties. Nothing is club root resistant. Um, the best thing to do with club root is to give it a good five or six year break. If we move on, and I'm watching my watch here, from kale, I would say the next probably popular would be um, a stubble turnip. Um, generally, uh, bulbing turnips will give us plenty of feed for October, November, December up to maybe the 20th of January, something like that. If you want a really hard uh, frost tolerant one, you'd go for Rondo, um, green skinned, white fleshed one, quite a small bulb, but very, very much more um, winter hardy. Um, stubble turnips are low cost. They're sort of um, something in the region of four or five pounds a kilo and you drill them at two kilos an acre. So it's a low cost option. When they first came over into this country, uh, they were called Dutch turnips or 80 day turnips. So um, what I suggest you do is, is work back from when you want to start utilizing them. They'll be about maximum yield about 110 days. But if you, um, if you, if you think about starting to utilize them from 80 days, um, all these things, all brassic crops respond to nitrogenous fertilizer. Um, and so we're looking at sort of in the region um, of the full season crops uh, at something like 100 
uh, units or 120 kilograms. And the shorter season crops like forage, rape and stubble turnips and hybrids, um, maybe 75 kilograms of nitrogen or, 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 or you know, plenty of slurry. Um, um, muck uh, makes all these things grow. Obviously, you wouldn't want to slurry at a level um, greater than the recommended rate. Um, so you'll all, of course, remember not to do that. Although if you happen to get it wrong, brassica crops love it. Um, uh, after stubble turnips, we've got the hybrid brassicas. These are generally crosses between kales and rapes or kales and Chinese cabbages. Sometimes they're crosses with all sorts of other things, but generally they're all dwarf rapes. Um, if you look them up, they're brassica napas, so they're, they're generally dwarf rapes. A lot of them are bred in New Zealand by PGG Wrightsons. You'll be familiar with a lot of the names. They have a slightly higher yield than a stubble turnip um, and a slightly higher yield than a forage rape. Um, I think when they first came out here, we thought we'd have the, the winter hardiness of a kale and the feeding value of a kale, along with the establishment vigor of a forage rape. In fact, they perhaps got a little more of the establishment vigor of a, of a kale and the winter hardiness of a rape. So they are an in-between crop, but they're well worth looking at, probably about six tons of dry matter a hectare. What does that mean? That, that probably means you would feed... Um, uh, suck cows should probably feed uh, about four on on a, on a hectare for 100 days. So we're looking at Swedes and kale about six. We're looking at um, hybrids giving you maybe four um, cows uh, for 100 days. Uh, and then we come back into the dear old forage rape. Um, stubble turnips and forage rape are much more aggressive against flea beetle. In fact, if you combine them together and maybe, and, and of course, officially with a third ingredient, um, you kind of get a leaf structure that deflects the flea beetle. So very often a mixture that has a little bit of kale or a, or a, a green top scotch turnip or something, along with rape and, and stubble turnip, we get less flea beetle um, damage. Um, they're not sure just where to go and they get a little bit of, um, uh, uh, they, they lose their flight patterns and so on. So forage rape is the most aggressive of them all. It'll only give us about four tonnes of dry matter a hectare, maybe four and a half. So it'll feed many less cows. You're probably looking at three cows, about 500, 550 kilogram on a hectare for 100 days. So quite a bit less, but forage rape will grow where other things won't. Um, it grows in my boot every single year. It grows in the footwell of my passenger side every year. And that is just in a carpet with water on it. And, um, you know, if you spill some in the yard, it will grow. Uh, and it tends to get away from flea beetles. So you've got quite a range of brassica crops there from the very vigorous, easy to establish anywhere uh, forage rape, right up to the quite difficult to establish Swedes and Kales. But obviously they've got a, a longer utilization period into the year uh, into the year following forage rape i tend to say really try and use october november december a little bit of of, of into um january but it depends on the year uh, if you sow it too early if you sow it in may um, it, it a lot of these things are likely to go to flower head in that situation either start utilizing them earlier or, or knock the flowers off uh, top them uh, put something through them. I did say I would mention some of the other things. Um, I'll do so briefly. Fodder beet is the highest amount of energy you will harvest from a hectare. It beats grasses, it beats the, the, the whole lot. It is an extremely expensive crop to grow, but if you're on good land and you have access to um, good agrochemicals and, and, um, and, and are prepared to spend the money, the fertilizers, the salt, um, it will work. It's probably three herbicides maybe one pre and two post or two pre and one post. Um, it's slow to compete with broadleaf weeds in the early part of its life. Like even in July, people are saying that really can be a very, very substantial crop. Um, you know, you're looking at fresh weights of, of, of 8,500 tons a, a hectare. Uh, with people who've been unbelievably good to feed in situ uh, and it's even better to lift if you've got the equipment to lift it um, in this situation we're probably talking west coast and, and Lanarkshire and places like that and, and it's not going to be lifted so you want a beat that is sitting well out of the ground and um, something with 60 percent plus out, out out of the ground these tend to be the beats that have the lower dry matter uh, lower dry matter just like a swede the lower the dry matter the less winter hardiness they have and this year, we very clearly saw that the hard 
hide dry matter, white beets that sit in the ground, the, the, the ones that they lift, tolerated the frost a lot better than the orange beets that sit out of it and, and the red beets that I sell, I'll be honest, um, sit right out of the ground. Um, really, they suffered quite badly. Forage rye is a, you know, it's a wheat rye cross. It's um, drilled in the autumn. It can be grazed in the autumn. It can be grazed right through the spring of the year. Big downside of forage rye, folks, is it's really in demand. Um, it's using a lot of green cover crops. It's quite an expensive seed only because the sowing rate is high. If you're sowing sort of 60, 70 kilograms an acre and it's a pound a kilo at 60 or 70 pounds an acre, um, that's why it can be, be, be quite expensive. Um, uh, but uh, what people have done this year is they've grazed it. Uh, they've grazed it early enough for it to spring back and it's just been cut at the moment in May. Um, and, you know, it's, it's uh, six, seven feet high crops um, and, and unbelievably large crops. That will not always happen, um, but it is there. To have a living root in the, in the soil um, uh, so that we don't just use a forage crop and then have nothing uh, with certain stubble turnips and, and forage rape, to put um, five, six, seven kilograms an acre of Italian ryegrass in with it, so maybe two kilograms of rape or one and a half kilograms of rape and half a kilogram of green globe turnips, along with seven kilograms of Italian, you get the grazing of the rape, the grazing of the turnips, and the rye grass is there, entirely leafy in the year of sowing, then through the winter, and you still have it up until you decide what you're going to do March, April. And you've got this bite of green, and even more important, you've got a good root system there, keeping um, things above the ground, nice early growing grass. So, um, for those people, and many of us should be thinking about it, where we want to have cover over all the acres so we don't have bare ground, putting five to seven kilograms of Italian ryegrass in with some of the brassicas um, really is very, very useful at, at giving us a living root, but also a bite at the time of year, February, March, April, when we don't have much else. You just ease back the amount of, of the brassica. I'm watching my watch here in front of me, folks, and I have to be very careful because I can talk for all night and I think I've said enough. I'll wait until there's any questions. Thank you. I'm sure there's more to come from you, Paddy. I think we'll, we'll come back. Um, just really to highlight, I suppose we did, you and I did a podcast um, a few months ago just on this topic and it goes into maybe a wee bit more, more depth on what we just covered there. And I, I would just highlight that it's on the Farm Advisory Service uh, website under Stock Talk. Um, and yeah, worth worth a listen if you want to hear more from me and Paddy. Maybe you've had enough already, <laughs> but no, I'm sure not. Um, Andy, so you you've done an awful lot of, I suppose, early trial work with outwintering options and things, and developed quite a, an an interesting system at Cograft. Do you want to run through what you do um, at home, and then we can come into it a bit more later. Well, what we do, we we have deferred grazing and we have kale crops. Uh, We've grown kale crops here since the 60s. My father started growing them in 65, I think it was. And over the years, we've developed different ways of doing it. And now, now that we're spring calving, we used to use, we used to have autumn calving and we used the hill through the, the summer. Now we're spring calving, we tend to use it through the winter. So we shut up a lot of the hill ground from end of June right through until maybe November. And if we get a drought, then we have the choice to use it or we keep it right through until we wean all the calves. We wean the calves in October. The cows go up to the deferred grazing till Christmas, hopefully. And then they come down onto the kale. Um, we've grown kale for a long time. Our, our soil is fairly free draining. So we have plenty of choice on which fields we do. We still There are still fields on my place that I wouldn't sow kale. Uh, some of the fields are a bit steep. There's water courses round about them. You know, you still have to be careful. You've got to stick to your geek. Uh, you need shelter, you need water, you need all that you would need if you were in a shed. Um, so, we, so we've so we grazed the hill uh, for the last 15 years we've done deferred grazing. Uh, and then once we got onto kale, we put out the roughage, the, the bales of hay or the bales of straw in August uh, so that they're already there, so that we don't have to be traveling through that field uh, with machinery when it's, really not suitable to do so. Uh, you know, we have fields that we could do it off the main road or off, off the, the farm track if we needed, but we prefer to put the, the, the roughage into the field ready to go 
so that come November, December, we have everything there and all we have to do is set up a fence. Um, once you've picked your field, I mean, I tend to pick my field maybe two years before I know I'm going to do it so that I can control the weeds on the run up to doing the kale and then we burn it off and we either direct drill or we just give it a light disc depending and quite often we've got a lot of dung we try to get you rid of and if we don't have a field that's cultivated then we have nowhere to really put this stuff so uh, the last couple of years I've actually disked some of it rather than plough we've got really stony land and lifting stones is not my my thing really so we try to disc or direct drill so if we if we don't direct drill we'll try and disc in some some of our own dung. Uh, the, the direct drilling <clears throat> is really good. You've, you've still got a bit of soil there, a bit of structures, so that when you are grazing it off, there's not as much movement of soil, especially if you've any steep ground or sloping ground. Um, but it does take a bit longer to come through. So, you know, a cultivated field sown out in kale, it's not long till it comes through and it, you can see there's a nice green tinge to the field. If you wait the same length of time for drilled stuff, you start to panic and think it's not going to happen. But you've just got to be patient. You know, I, I've in the past I had Andrew Best on his hands and knees crawling about, uh, telling him it was a disaster. But he said, "No, no, it's all there." And sure enough, the shower of rain and it, it was there. But so it does take longer to come through. Um, you know, we use as a as a source of roughage, we use straw or hay. Last year I bought a load of hay because it was cheaper than straw. We wrap it set it out in the field and it is hard to guess what the yield of your, your crop's going to be in August. Uh, so we try and set them out maybe four or five metres apart up the field. But you do, sometimes you, you if you've not got enough kale, your kale's not grown as well, then you're using more bales and vice versa. Uh, two years ago, I grew a crop and in August it was, it was only 12 inches tall and I thought it was going to be a disaster. And then we got some rain and by the end of September, it was taller than the bales. So it, it yielded a phenomenal yield. I mean, now we would expect maybe 11, 11 tons of dry matter to the hectare. We got 15 uh, off that field. And it was, it was, I've never seen a crop like it. It was, it was chest high. But you know, I grow Caledonian or Maris Kestrel. My father's always grown from Maris Kestrel since the sixties. And we've only really changed to Caledonian in the last two or three years, but I, I still do like Maris Kestrel. Caledonian grows quite tall and if you get a lot of stormy weather or snow it can go down and this winter with the hard frost we had in December some of the stuff that was down that was touching the ground rotted whereas the Maris Kestrel pretty much stayed on its feet. Um, some of your fields that you would choose uh, try not to do any drainage before you sow it because they've got deep roots and it can get into your drains. Uh, we we actually use kale as a method of telling you where you have problems. Uh, kale doesn't like wet feet. So if you've got water logging or wet bits in your field, your, your kale will not really grow. Uh, any compaction issues, you know, your kale will point a lot of that out. So we use it and, and we rectify the problem before we go back into grass. So we used to grow kale for two years in a row. Uh, and the second year of the crop was just phenomenal. But we weren't getting around to reseeding quick enough. So we tend to just do one at a time so that we are getting around the farm and it's, it is a method of break break crop from grass because we are purely grass we've you know it's very stony land we don't like to plow so we we have grass and then kale and then back into grass so um we've used various drills to drill uh we've used the duncan we've used the hs and uh the earth i've, I've use the earth it's it's a new one it's very good but the, the moor uni drill seems to be the the popular one at the moment a lot of the contractors are buying uh, but it all depends on your contractor what machine you end up using because whoever's closest tends to be the one you use um but you get equally good results with direct drilling or or disking um your your, your crop of kale will effectively grow you two cuts of silage the, the amount of yield you'll get from it will be the same as if you'd shut it off a silage and cut it twice. Um, we we feed roughly 40 to 50 suckler cows on 15 to 20 acres every winter. Uh, and that usually lasts from Christmas right through till calving. And I, I hope, I always plan for it to last to calving so I don't have to bring these cows in. These cows should 
calve outside. So we'll, once they've finished the kale, they'll come onto the fields and hopefully it's a dry spring and we, we can calve them outside without having to these cattle to touch concrete. Because I think as soon as a suckler cow puts his feet in concrete, it's costing you money. So <clears throat> we're, we're trying to have our deferred grazing and then our kale and then calve outside. So the cows are fit, not fat. We very seldom have any calving problems. We've, I've just calved, I think I've got five left out of 130 and I've calved three. The calves were all a fantastic size and, and they're all Charlie calves. So they're, they're, they're not a, a native bred bull. So, uh, you know, the cows are in good order and they calve down very well. Uh, when it comes to utilization, there are there is a formula that you can work out how much you're going to need to move your fence every day, but generally you'll learn very quickly how to do it by eye. Um, if you've given them too much, there'll be a bit of stem left the next morning. If you're not giving them enough, they'll be standing roaring at the gate. But I tend to think that whatever they can clear in two hours is, is what they need. Two hours and they've got it cleared and you'll never hear a peep out of these cattle again. Um, when it comes to, to roughage, I'm a bit miserable because I'm buying it. I mean, I've got 40 cows and they get one round bale of straw or hay and that's it. I'm sure, I'm sure Robert would probably tell me that I need to give them three, but if I'm paying 95 quid a ton for barley straw or hay, they're getting one and that's fine. But if you're needing to extend, if you think you're not gonna have enough and you need these cattle to stay outside, then you can extend your winter by giving them silage and maybe moving a ring feeder every day, you can do that. I don't particularly like trying to manhandle a ring feeder around a muddy old field in the middle of the winter, but some people do that. Uh, there have, have been some that lift the fence over it and just let the cattle have it. That Yeah, it works, but there, you know, there's a bit more mess to maybe try and sort out when you go to reseed it. But I, I, I've, I've kind of developed a, a frame that I've made that to, to do behind the quad bike that I knock a spike through the bale and put the frame onto this spike and I roll it out along the face. So twice a week, I'll roll out eight or nine bales along the where, where the face is going to be and then they graze the, the straw on top of the kale. Uh, and that seems to work quite well. Um, minerals wise, you just can't get them to take minerals. They need that, you know, iodine is, uh, kale is low in iodine and trying to get them to eat minerals is just impossible. So we started oh, 20 years ago, we give them co-secure boluses with iodine in them. So they've got the trace element boluses and their iodine uh, and they've got roughage and they've got the, the, the kale itself. So yeah, there are many different ways of doing it, but we, we try to do it that way that, that we, we strip graze it with the bales in field because you know yourself, you think, okay, we'll, we'll manage it in the winter, but you get, we get 56 inches of rain here in the southwest and sometimes it feels like they're all fallen in a couple of weeks so trying to get bales into a field and get back out without making a mess uh, isn't that practical so so we we started doing it oh a long time ago 30 odd years ago in the days before wrap and we we bagged the bales uh, and it worked well so we've carried on doing that and it, it does work really well there's not a lot of waste if you need to extend your winter then put more bales in the crop um what else can I say about that? Fencing, you need a good, good power supply and plenty of posts. Because once you, if your cattle break through once, you'll never stop them breaking through. So, so we, we have plenty of power. We have actually a reel at both ends so that when you move the fence in the morning, switch the power off, you can move it and take the slack with you so that when you get to the far end, you can reel it into that end rather than have a big handful of wire that you don't know what to do with. So small things like that, that we've, we've learned over the years, make it so much easier. You know, some people try and move them with the power on, which is, yeah, it's doable, but when you start them, if there's an awkward bit in the field or a corner or whatever, uh, we feel, we find that, that switch the power off, but keep the wire tight in your hand while you move the posts. We have a lot more success with steel posts. Um, I've used plastic posts in the in the past, but in my stony ground, we need the, the heavier steel post and never any more than nine meters apart. If you try and stretch it a bit, that'll be the night that they break through. And usually if they break through, it's, it's human error or there's been a power cut. So I have some fields that I use a battery operated energizers so that 
there isn't a risk of a power cut because a friend of mine had 150 cows out on various fields last winter and overnight there's a power cut and in the morning they were everywhere. So we do have a couple of fields that we try and keep on battery powered energizers. So there's always a plenty of power. Um, we mainly, we've, we've put young stock on them in the past, but we, we felt we were wasting too much. We we're having to keep them going and giving them more and more crop and leaving a lot of valuable stem behind. So we just use suckler cows uh, and they, we try and fatten them. We try and get them fat through the summer off grass and then through the winter, they can afford to lose a couple of condition scores. Uh, so yeah, they, we're not wanting them to, to get thin, but we, we want them to lose a bit of weight. So, so they stand it, the weather, the weather can be a bit sore on them sometimes, but you know, you, on a really miserable wet day, they, they look like they're not very happy, but the next day the sun shines and they'll be the most content animals on the farm. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I've not covered. Um, yeah, mainly the main thing is weed control before you start and then burn it off. And then I, I sometimes burn it off again before it goes back into the next crop because there's, you know, that there's always a build up of weeds and the, the, the year that you don't do it is a year that the next crop is just nothing but weeds. So, so I, I think kale gives you an opportunity to control the weeds uh, on your farm uh, quite well. Um, Robert, I don't know if there's anything else that I have missed that you can... I think just on that, there's a, one that annoys me is that the fact that when it's a dirty reseed is that the following year after after brassicas, it always seems to be yeah. more red sank, more, you know, yeah. more of a problem. Your your option there is to put, to burn it off, to so do like a steel seed bed, allow the weeds to come and spray it off again. What about the other option or the way, and I mean, I'm, I'm really just trying to justify the way I'm doing it. <laughs> um, we put the clover in after. Yeah. So just basically put, put a, and it's not, it, we're not certainly not on the, Depends where you are on the regen journey and where you are with multi-species swords and all kinds of things. But for our clover and ryegrass lay, I think we, we often have a, you know, it can be a challenge getting grass seed in. And the, the sooner it's in, the sooner it's growing. So, yeah. uh, Paddy, is there any thoughts on, what's your thoughts on the, the preferred option, just the one that works? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, you know, fertile soil, particularly wet fertile soil, you're going to see red shank everywhere. Um, Northern Ireland is red shank from one county to the other. Um, we're increasingly seeing people asking for no clover options. The problem is when you sow a full reseed, uh, just straight off, you've maybe got three quarters of a kilo an acre of clover in it. When you overseed, Robert, you've got to go to one and three quarters, one and a half to two anyway. Uh, Andy, I hope will agree with that. And that's quite a lot more expensive because clover, you know, used to be seven and a half quid. It's 11 quid this year. So it's suddenly become quite a lot more expensive. Um, but yeah, it, it allows you to to clean out the weeds. I would definitely try the stale seed bed and the stale seed bed again. Glyphosate is still with us. It's relatively cheap. It works tremendously well. That would be, and I would sow with the clover in and then see what happens. Um, I, I see Andy's nodding, so I'll let him come in. That's exactly what I do. I, I, I pick out the field I'm going to put in kale and I'll control the weeds maybe for a couple of years beforehand, try and knock the docks a bit, try and any thistles and then spray it off with Roundup into kale. And then the next year, you're doing it with Roundup again. So you're, you've had a good long time to try and get rid of the weeds. So then you put your, your next reseed in. I, always would, I would always recommend to put the clover in because even if you have a weed problem, you could get a couple of years out of the, the, the clover before you have to really do anything. I still think it's the best option. Um, you know, the, the amount of nitrogen that's going to fix is going to outweigh you know, you could probably get, I mean, my, I've got a crop there that this year that's, I've just cut it, just cut it this afternoon and it, and it was sown last year, tremendous crop after kale, the clover is fantastic. Yeah, there's a few docks showing, but I'll not, I'm, they don't worry me really, there's not a lot of them. So hopefully I can spot spray them. But if I, if I hadn't put the clover in, I would think I would have been quite disappointed with it this year. Yeah. So it just gives you, it gives you three, three goes at it, controlling your weeds before you put it back into grass. Mm -hmm. if, if it's docks, of course, it's, it's a much bigger problem. But if it's ordinary broadleaf weeds, you know, charlocks or fuma trees, you know, ranch, red shank, the mower or the mouth does a hell of a good job in managing that weed. 
I mean, obviously, your dock is your major one, Robert, and it is that it's it's totally different because it's a perennial weed. But um, you know, these others, these annual weeds, are controlled very well by the greys or 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 the dear old mower does a great job. Yeah, a lot, a lot of the dairies they just don't they just say no clover, no clover. I don't want clover because I've got so many docks. So yeah, I understand yeah. why they don't, but I would still I would still say it's worth it's worth doing when you do so. And I suppose if you had millions of gallons gallons of slurry at the back of you and loads of free nitrogen there or, or bought a different way nitrogen in the, in the slurry, the, the clover value is maybe less. But for us, yeah. it's it's crucial. I've got a question here about um, crop mixes. So forest crop mixes for after cereal crops. So, you know, after winter barley and after spring barley. Um, what, what should we be, or what would be ideal for sowing if it's, say, kind of, Autumn sown for a kind of December, January graze. What, what would your go-to be to both of you actually? What would the what's the options and what's the kind of best case scenario? Okay, I'll I'll, I'll answer first, maybe Andy. Uh, thanks, Robert, because it's much easier to answer first. Um, if we're after winter barley, you know, we're talking of a late July, early August combining date. This is assuming it's combined rather than whole cropped. Uh, a bit earlier. So if it's if it's then you've got to look at rape and stubble turnips really predominantly because we're not going to have anything else that's going to be in the ground long enough. Um, uh, kale is too late in my book anyway uh, for then uh, as is everything else. So I would just say um, um, uh, sort of two thirds rape, one third stubble turnips with another ingredient. Remember we have to have a third ingredient folks. Um, it's because rape is on the forage, uh, is on the oil seeds register and, and stubble turnips are on the fodder register and you're not allowed to sow a mix of the two other than if you mix it at your drill, you can't buy a mix of just two, you have to buy another ingredient. So we normally put in 5% stubble tur um, green globe or kale or something to make it legal. So higher proportion of rape if it's be, being used uh, October, November, December, and a slightly higher proportion of stubble turnover if it's November, December, January. Perfect. Any advance on that, Andy? I, I would agree with that, yeah. I, I mean, a, a lot of guys, if it was whole crop, they would maybe put in Red Start or something like that. But, um, yeah, I would agree. If you, after, after harvest, you're limited in your options. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of guys down this neck of the woods went in with Red Start, and then by Christmas, it was all gone. So, you know, but we've not had that in years. We've had a, a big success of, of these crops. And then this winter, we had a really hard frost and guys that relied on it for their winter keep, for their suckler cows were, were in a, a bit of a pickle. But you need a backup plan. It was really unfortunate the way that year worked in that it got very hard very early. And then it turned it into harder. late. Uh, and then, you know, it was almost in, in reverse. But um, the other one is about, so it's a similar question, but looking at greening and EFA areas. So we've obviously got, for, for arable farmers, we've got um, ecological focus area and, and as part of the greening uh, measures that we need to, need to undertake. What, what can we do if we want to eat some of that stuff? So that's the stuff that will be, so it needs to be EFA compliant and grazable after the 1st of January. So Paddy, you've spoken about this before. What, <laughs> what are the, the well, we have these are the options? We have to use two of their 11 okay two of their 11 so let, let's be honest here most farmers will dip into a barn and take out farm saved oats or farm saved barley because it's an arable situation and we will we'll graze particularly the oat because it tillers very well it has no mildew it doesn't have eye spot it doesn't uh, have, a, have a have a problem with with them um, you know take all so um maybe 30 kilograms an acre of a spring um uh, spring barley spring oat Bring oat because an oat actually goes through the winter really quite well. If you look at the back of your combine, your winter, your spring barley start to die off. But if you've got oats out the back of a combine, it stays greener a lot longer. So I say 30 kilos an acre of of an of a spring oat, um, and of course you would be paying royalties on that seed. Uh, I said looking at the ground Absolutely. here, just remember if they were, Andy's laughing. Uh, and into that, I either use a vetch or a wee bit of a, a a crimson clover. I'll be honest. I know it says red clover white clover, we can argue that a crimson clover is a red clover. I have argued that point. Um, crimson clover, why do I say it? Um, largely because it is a bit 
more fro it's much more frost tolerant than a bursting clover, but it does a lot really quickly. The other one would be a vetch. Um, Look, vetches used to be a pound fifty a kilo. They're nearly three quid a kilo at the moment. That's just because the demand for these things is massive. Um, but the vetch crop is about to be. It's been cleaned at the moment. It's been a you know early harvest for it. We will have vetches coming down. What would I use of it? Maybe twelve kilos an acre, thirty kilos a hectare of vetch. Um, so by the first of January in EFA, when you're ready to graze, you've got two grazing things: a spring oat and a vetch. I do have uh, mixtures as well of forage, rye, and things like that, but they cost far too much. But cool. Um, the question for Andy is about so we've got a tremendous dry spell, and and the dry spell is is it becoming a problem yet? It's always a difficult one. It's always good to be sitting in the garden drinking a beer, wondering about your problems rather than uh, wrapped up next to the fire. So, um, but certainly it is dry when. When do we go for it? If if we've got a we've got a dry spell here just now, how long do we keep it in the bag? And you know, what's your advice for dry weather? So we... the the forecast at the minute is we're not likely to get rain for the next ten days. So I wouldn't I wouldn't even begin out the bag unless I knew there was going to be some rain coming coming, because it 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 is seriously dry at the minute and getting drier by the day. And we're talking twenty two degrees here today, twenty two degrees tomorrow apparently. So I, I would be in no rush. I mean, kale, kale, I mean, we always said end of May, beginning of June. Last year, there was guys down here that sowed it right through till Highland Show, uh, and their crops were tremendous. So there's time yet. There is time yet. Don't start panicking. It's a bit like I've, I've had people phone me up and say, I'm going to have to plow it in. It's a disaster. And I just say, just sit still. Do not do, not do anything until it rains. And as soon as you get rain, things come right. We all start to panic and start to plow stuff up. But no, I I wouldn't be getting anything out the bag yet. I think I would I would wait a bit yet. But it's only it's only the end of May. It's only the end yeah. of May. Yeah. The, the beauty as well Rock. is we're going to get a contractor. You know, there's there's so much silage and so much other stuff done that yeah. there is, we are going to get a contractor before the rain. Sorry, Paddy, on you go. Simple. Uh, all I would say is get the seed home though. Um, you know, we, we, we've had a, a month of May with three Mondays off and the pressure on, on hauliers doesn't go away. So, folks, I would really sit, say get the seed home. And he's absolutely right. There's going to be rain at some point. Um, so if you have the seed there and there's diesel in the tank, you can do something. There's no diesel and no seed. You're knackered. So get it home. Yeah. Take it. And is there any... It. Is there any, what is the best company to buy the seed from? No, we'll not go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, question again, and I, I think this is an opinion one as well, is do we graze it uphill or graze it downhill if we're strip grazing a forage crop? Strictly speaking, I would be, I would be grazing it downhill. Which hat have you, your, which hat have you got on when you say that? Obviously both. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, we've all got fields that, I mean, I've got, I've got, Couple of fields that I've grazed in three different directions over the winter, depending on where we were, weather-wise, water-wise, shelter-wise. So uh, yeah, you really should do it downhill. I know it's not easy, and you've got to plan where your lieback is because people sometimes forget. Oh, we'll grow a forage crop, but you need to supply lieback. So like that needs planning as well, where you're going to have something for them to go back to. After a couple of weeks, they'll not go back to the lieback, but you still have to provide it you know the, the driest place to lie is the place they've eaten that day so they'll lie along the fence line mm -hmm. but early on they will go back but after a couple of weeks they're too lazy they'll not walk back you know, if you left a tub of minerals 10 yards behind them they wouldn't go back never mind 30 yards back to, mm -hmm. to a dry lie they will lie in the fence line so you've got to plan your drug the biggest thing is planning what direction you're going to graze it before you even spray it off because you'll need to leave a strip of grass for them to lie on. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, I think the thing is risk assessment, isn't it? You know, the uphill, downhill thing, the the textbook is downhill. The And we know we know exactly why, but those fields that are up and down and all, you know, the, a lot of the fields that we put kale in are, are now a fields that are all over the place. That water course, you, you look at what's happened in New Zealand with forage crops, they've gone to town with them and are getting absolutely hung out to dry with the bad news stories. And those are either environmental stories or overstocked crops of fodder beat on the side of a main road. It, apparently there's 11 million head of livestock in the South Island alone grazed on fodder beat. 
No wonder the rivers are polluted. Yeah. You know, that's a serious amount of livestock. Yeah, yeah. So it's the it's the keeping all this stuff in mind, and it's it's a great system, but it's one that we it's a system that we can make work, but forcing it, putting pressure on it, doing things doing doing things away from best practices are pretty dangerous and, place to start. And we make mistakes. We make mistakes. That's where, how we learn. You know, I, yeah. I've learned in the past that we've we've grazed the field the wrong way or we've put the bales in the wrong place. You know, it, it's all practice. And once you get once you get to know how you do it, it, you pretty much hit it right all the time. But I mean, I've I've sown kale all my life, and my and my father did before me, and I've not once had flea beetle at all in kale. I'm, I've been obviously very lucky. Whereas last year, anyone that grew a uh, red start later in the season down with us in, in near Cas Douglas, they were all hammered with it. But the kale crops seemed to miss out. So you know, there's a lot of luck. There's a lot of luck and a lot. Of, it's a good thing that you've recorded that on a webinar publicly that you've never had an issue before. Yeah. So. I'm touching a big, very, very big wooden table. At <laughs> yeah. The yeah. Um, what about Paddy? See for water. So these crops are generally pretty wet. They're really high yield. They're, they're really high yields of dry matter, but there's a lot of moisture in them. How important is water, and how do we manage the the water system within a strip grazing scenario? Uh, well, you leave the water at the back where they don't need to go for it. Um, but I would say alkathene pipes across the surface um, is probably going to be the best. Um, uh, you know, they're going to have probably, I mean, Andy has a straw or hay. A lot of people would be using silage in the ring feeder, I would guess. Uh, so the water requirement would be less. Um, you know, when we think of, of, I know this is cattle and cows tonight, but in sheep, obviously, that you're supposed to leave them 30% fibre uh, alongside. Let's face it, there's not a lamb ever turns back and eats a single piece of fibre. Once they're onto the kale or the stubble, or, then they never eat anything else. But we legally have to make it there for them. So, yeah, water has to be available. I don't really know as much about that, Robert, to be able to give you more of an answer. But I would say uh, if you make water available in each field, it's up to the beast whether she goes for it or not. I had a question about Kiwi Tech, the portable troughs, you know, whether is it worth investing for for strip grazing kale is it worth investing in complex water infrastructure and i honestly don't think it is because they will they need to have running water they need to have access to it you never know what the scenario is but i honestly think if the trough was off i don't think it would you know i'm not suggesting any, any of us trial that one but um the trough certainly isn't the most poached area in the field which tells us quite a lot um, I'm trying to think other questions, and there, are, there is time. There's a few here that we can bunch together, and there's time for a few more if anyone's keen. Um, Andy, what about transition from kale to grass at calving? So how how early do you do that, and how what is your process there? Well, because mine are getting a bit of hay anyway, quite often nearer the time I'm giving them silage as well, near the end. So there isn't really a much transition anyway. You know, the, the, the good bit of the diet is is forage anyway. So I, it's not that you're going from fodder wheat or something like that onto something completely different. So I I just, you know, they're, they're, they're getting hay or silage or straw. They're going on to a similar type ration, but just minus the kale. So that it's not really a big problem. Never has been with me anyway. And do they get like a pre-cabin bucket or a high mag bucket or something just? I, I start giving them a, a high mag bucket before they go onto the grass in the spring okay yeah um but the, the you know i try and <laughs> i try and sprinkle uh pre-carbon minerals on on their their um silage that they're going to go on to you know once they come off the kale into that they'll they'll get for a fortnight before hopefully they start carving they'll get some some pre-carbon minerals as well so mm -hmm. but they've, you know they, they've got the bolus in them anyway which is is giving them a lot but we'll we'll put a pre-carver on top of the silage that they're going to get after that but transitions fairly very straightforward yeah i think the, those calving outside or, or just moving on to calving outside the magnesium story is an awful lot more than just staggers you know that magnesium story is so important for slow calving so don't you know i think for all the cost that's involved in it stick those buckets out or stick you know high mag cobs or whatever we're doing get it into them because it's yeah. you know the price iodine, of it, iodine the value magnesium. Of it yeah iodine for the kale magnesium for the carbon yeah definitely yeah and what about parasites so what we're obviously 
you know, you and I have probably similar rainfalls and parasites fluke particularly. What, what's your process? We don't have that housing, six month housing period where we can break the cycle. Is yeah. that a challenge? Well, well, what what I tend to do is maybe halfway through the winter, I'll give them a fluke dose and I'll go through them and pick out any leaner cows or any that are expecting twins and maybe hold them inside. And then when they move to come on into car, into the fields to calve, I'll give them another one then because you're not you're not able to keep them inside for seven weeks before you give them their mm -hmm. fluke. So it's the best best you can really do. I mean, my, anything else that's inside will be inside for seven or eight weeks and then they'll be fluked. But uh, with the kale, you haven't really got an option. So I give them two, one halfway through the winter and one at the end of the, basically at the end of the kale. Yeah, yeah. And Paddy, what about a plan B? See if we've got that horrible October. So it's rained since August. The ground conditions are really poor. What Have you any advice or examples that we can call on for when things aren't quite going to plan? Yeah, you, you look back over your records and see what grass field has performed worst. Yeah, and you use that as a sacrifice field. That's it. You go into that grass field, which has a has a level of density in it, and you puddle it up because, you know, you're going to buy new seed from either Andy Nelson or Paddy Jack next year. So um, it's, it becomes the sacrifice field, uh, and that's the, that's the best plan B. Um, you know, you can't really go ahead and have a sown crop of something else for it. It's, it's. I mean, the, the level of re, you know reseeding in Scotland is massively below where it needs to be, Robert. And more of us need to take the plunge and get rid of some of these old fields that are giving us five, five and a half, six tons of, of dry matter, and get some younger grasses into them and get you know twelve, fourteen tons of dry matter off them. Um, I, I hate to say it, but the dairy farmers are better at reseeding uh, because they measure it every bloody day. Um, and I think if we were able to measure things more often, we would realize the benefit, particularly of the first four years of young grass. I mean, they are, they're, they're massive yielders. And even if nitrogenous fertilizer is down to 330 a ton, it still pays to have young grass. Um, so I would say plan B, the worst performing field on the, on, on the farm, ring feeders or, or trail feeders uh, into that. I would say, and there's, there's only, I think that there's only one of me here and there's two of you, but there are also, so in the, in the dairy scenario, they're really good at buying more grass seed and, and spending money. In the beef and sheep scenario, there's, there is a, a want and need for better nutrition of grass that's there as well. So, you know, soil health and lime, P and K, make sure that the, soil has the is, has the right fertility before we start buying grass seed you know and i'm sure that is you, your guys message as well um but the there are farms that do have many farms out there that do have you know a tunnel a tunnel line to the acre would be the two tunnel line to the acre would be the, the best thing we could do um be yeah, just kind of, if, get you spend the money if you haven't got the cash spend spend what you've got on lime every time you know a, P, a ph of a ph of five you'll only use half the, the nitrogen you put on and two thirds of the P and K. So get your pH right. That's the pH right in young grass. Yeah, perfect. There's a question here from the floor that's just come in uh, about, so the best method, method of sowing any forage, a forage crop in a regen setting. So obviously using regenerative and organic principles do we just accept that there's going to be a lot of weeds or is there a process, is there a, a way we can minimise a, the, you know, weed competition? Either, who wants to go first? <laughs> Andy, I took the easy one last time first, if you want to take <laughs> this one first. It's a difficult one. It is a difficult one. Uh, <clears throat> you know, depend, I suppose it all depends on, on, on your weed burden that you think you have in the first place. You know how you deal with it. I mean, I, I suppose in that case you're more likely to plow and turn it over. Um, but then that has other implications. You know, you couldn't you couldn't stitch stitch stuff in to the existing sward without the use of glyphosate. So yeah, I, I think I think probably you're going to have to plow it and work it and then sow it. If it's a true regen where it's no glyphosate and and no plough, Andy, um, which yep, is, yeah. uh, a, a, let's be honest, a, a pretty stern challenge, uh, the small, whatever you sow is, is going to have to be something that's extremely vigorous. 
Um, and therefore, I think you're looking at, at, at forage rape and, and some of the hybrids, yeah? Um, because without the plow, the moldboard plow gives us a wonderful, wonderful seed bed. But let's face it, it came along a thousand years ago to bury weeds. <laughs> and if we ain't got glyphosate, the moldboard plow does a tremendous job. But if we regen where there's no plowing and where there is no um, glyphosate, then I, I, just a very vigorous crop that you're going to put into it. Um, chomp the other, whatever's left down. Um, of of your of your your regen mixture, whatever the multitude of species that are in it, uh, and and get in. My guess would be simple old forage rape, because it'll grow anywhere. I actually wonder whether looking at the real regen principle and regen is probably used appropriately and inappropriately. You know, there's a there's a a regen movement and there's a need for. A growing soils in arable areas and there's a tremendous amount of work and, and power in the regen world for building soils, using ruminants, you know, telling the, understanding the full story of what the ruminant actually can do. I do wonder whether there's any regen way of putting a forage crop in, the, you know, I, I don't know if a forage crop actually is in the regen armory, if you like. I think the real regen principles are the best forage crop you can get is, is long grass deferred and then not not grazed within an inch of its life. Because what we do with kale is graze the every last possible bit we can get and poach the rest of it in. Whereas le the regen principle there is to to leave behind half of at least half of what you what you started to graze. So I think we need to be careful with what what regen actually means. It, that there's a it's too widely used, you know. I think there's a, there's other words that we need to start defining what what we're actually doing. Low low input, the uh, organic principles. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that a lot of people are trying to do that all fall under one umbrella. Um, but yeah, that's a party political broadcast. Um, the just I suppose to highlight, we actually have a the, the new FAS app, which is just being launched, has a tool. Sandy, you were talking about calculating how many bales and how far to move the fence and all that kind of thing. We've got a calculator that will help with that. So it doesn't, nothing beats boots on the ground and, and feeling your way through it. And as you see, Andy, your cows will tell you how to do it. But there is a a, a tool there that will help to, you know, you can put a, a, you can measure the crop, look at how much, how much crop you've got or expect to have, and then calculate how many bales you should have, what dry matter those bales are. And uh, so we'll, we'll get that out or, or highlight that to people. And we also have a, a suite of resources out there, a, an increasing suite of resources on outwintering forest crops, um, establishment utilization, uh, all this stuff. So we'll, we'll certainly have a, a bit of a pack of information to send out to um, everybody that's that's been on here tonight and also it's available on the website as well. The fodder beet story is, it's an expensive crop to establish. It's an incredibly cheap source of dry matter if it goes well, but what about the grazing of it? How, Andy was talking about kale or, or strip grazing and once the cattle go through the fence, we've got a problem for the rest of the year. Those cattle that go through the fence on fodder beet, how worried should we be, you know, transition wise? So transition onto the crop, and then over consumption of it. What, I mean, is it a is it too big a risk to be grazing? The, tran the transition onto fodder bait uh, needs uh, much longer than onto nearly any other crop. Probably, uh, you know, as as far as three weeks now, Robert. Um, um, it, it is much much slower than anything else because it's a very different sort of of, of um, uh, substance going into the into the room and. Um, uh, as far as them going through the fence, I, I can't answer that because I actually haven't had anybody complain to me that they've had an issue with it. I would guess you'd probably double fence it. So there's a hot wire, you know, four meters beyond that last hot wire um, and that they're both on. Um, I, I really don't know about them overindulging in it. Um, I know places where, um, uh, you know, they're, they're lifting it and feeding it and they're getting through really substantial quantities of fresh weight you know 50 kilograms into a cow i mean it's enormous fresh weight sometimes going into them but that's after a decent length of transition um, and obviously with a, a a quality of 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 long fiber as well um so um it does have an enormous ability to produce milk 
and to produce live weight gain. Um, you know, if it if it goes into a dairy cow, you'll certainly see milk jump. If it goes into a, a, a lamb and ewe, um, you will certainly see um, a massive increase in the availability. And I, I believe also the quality of the milk. And those that have bought lorry loads of it before they've grown it, I've always seen benefits. Um, but don't do it in a wet hole. Don't do it on, on a farm that's hungry for anything. <laughs> it's got to be a good acre. Uh, and therefore, it's suited to some farms and very definitely not suited to the majority. For us at home, so the, the, one of the challenges, I think, is in a high rainfall area, regardless of how, how dry the soil is, in a high rainfall area, the, the massive yield that comes with fodder wheat and the lack of root, so there's not that network of roots in below, um, we can make an awful mess pretty quick on a, on a field that would graze kale or graze rape or um, other lower yielding crops move the fence a bit further and it would do it, it would do it fine. You then do your calculation and realise you're moving the fodder beet fence half a metre rather than three or four metres. We can make we can make soup out of soil very quick. Um, would you would you look for look at fodder beet, Andy? You, you, I'm sure you must have, but I have thought about it, but I just you know I, the cost. Getting the pH to you, you're needing the pH a bit higher. Uh, I've, I've heard too many horror stories. To, I'm a bit scared, to be fair. But I have one field in mind that when it's due to be sown, I'm going to try. It's a it's a six acre field. I'm going to try it, and it's a good, fairly free draining field. Uh, and I think I'm going to try some and see. Um, I mean, I was at Jim Gibbs, one of Jim Gibbs' talks, and he was talking about cattle breaking through, and the farmer were at. He put young stock on it because he couldn't keep the cows on the right side of the fence he says they were that keen on it they would break through every day so he put them onto kale and kept young stock on the, the fodder beat and it seemed to work slightly better but you know uh, there's always going to be issues but i do i do like the sound of it but i think you've got to have the right farm and the right ground conditions to grow it yeah. i think yeah and, and it's you know that i think that is a take-home message for it all it's there's there's scope here for everyone in, in the outwintering story. It's finding the right crop that suits the farm you've got and the person that you are, the time you've got, the resources you've got available. And, you know, things like this, hopefully tonight's been a helpful starter for 10. Hopefully it's a, um, it opens a few doors and, and sows a few seeds, no pun intended. But um, it really is about getting on, doing things, having a wee, do a wee trial yourself, have a go and see what works for you. Because no amount of us saying what, what works and what doesn't work on our farms or in our experience, that all helps. But having a crack at it is, is fine. The thing I, I think as well is, is when we use it, we're always thinking, so there's a lot of people that will use it to shorten the winter. Now we can do that by, there's the risk of frost. So we, we, look, we've, we heard the stories earlier about a uh, frost damage in crops, but, that wet October I was talking about, or that real challenge, if we're going to be housing cattle anyway, perhaps if it's really wet to start with, house them first and turn them onto it later on after things start to dry up. And it's about cutting the cloth, cutting your own cloth to suit it. Um, but yeah, lots to think about, lots to discuss. And I'm sure both of you, um, Andy, you've got yeah, both your hats on, but I'm sure both of you will be happy to receive any, any questions or any correspondence from tonight. Yeah, this is a series, so we've got a few more to come. And really, we're trying to look at the key points through the farming calendar. Um, so we've obviously, we've established, after tonight, we've established a, a winter strategy, a forage crop strategy, uh, hopefully for a low cost winter. Uh, we then into August, look at weaning strategies. So looking at how do we have that most successful weaning uh, with, you know, lots of calves on the ground and, and high performing calves as well. Uh, into November, we've got health planning. Health planning is obviously an ongoing, um, there's never a, never a wrong time to start a health plan, um, but probably after scanning. So after you've scanned cows, you know, uh, you've basically reset the whole thing and you know what you're dealing with. So that, that health plan, planning webinar is in November. Uh, into January, again, the, it's the wrong end of the year, same as this. Uh, but it's the right end of the year with that in mind is grazing strategies. Quite often we're talking about rotational grazing and setting up an, a rotational grazing strategy in May 
and that's far too late. So obviously that January, um, we've got the whole the, or, or most of the winter and the spring to start thinking about how we make improvements um, and how we better the way we're grazing grass. Um, and then into February is optimising fertility. So uh, again, pre-calving, but how do we get these cows uh, or how do we maximise the number of calves that are in the cow? Because ultimately that's the, the biggest thing we can do to improve profitability and uh, our carbon credentials as well as to, as to optimise fertility, get more cows and calves, get more, more live calves in the ground. So that's what's coming. And certainly... Um, from me, all I've got to say is thank you very much.